It's 2024, I'm Jens Ansu, and I think it's about time we do an updated shop tour. We've been doing this channel for about a year now, and the first video out was a shop tour. And for these past 12 months, so much has happened. This is my studio. I'm an artist, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> this is what I consider somewhat the heart of my operation. Maybe it's not the heart of the shop, being it's not a shop, but I am a maker, I am a designer, and every single project that I make starts here. This is where I do all my creative work. This is where I do all my drawing, my design work. It's also where I kick back and relax, read some books, have a drink, or just listen to music. Music is a huge factor in my creative life. So, so, so this is one of my favorite spaces to spend time in, period. This is actually my drawing table that I used while studying architecture and design 25 years ago. So I, I used this table in the School of Architecture and it is by far one of my favorite furnitures. It's a uh, adjustable table. I have it for standing now. You can adjust it down for sitting. And I have to be honest with you, right? Very often this is a table that is just like one big shelf packed <laughs> with <laughs> packed with stuff it, it's fairly tidy now and featuring my brand new light table here which i am super excited about i've never owned a light table which is is kind of weird considering i make a living designing in a previous episode where we started out working with a new design for the, the custom side of things, I actually learned that I want to spend much more time hand sketching. And that's where a light table really comes in handy. I found that I stop my process a little early and go to CAD, uh, which is fine. And it's worked fine for the past 20 some years, but one of my goals for 24 is to do a lot more hand sketching and actually take the detail level of my drawings up a notch before I take them to CAD. And that's where the, the light table really shines because you can, you can have a drawing, you can take a blank piece of paper, put it on top and then trace your drawing, change whatever you want to change or add details and then you can start over. The main reason why it sits here is this is a great light, both for drawing and working, but also actually using it as a surface for shooting knife pictures. Often I will go outside to do product photography, but in January it's snowy, it's rainy, it's gray, not ideal. So having a great space where you can just lay out whatever product you want to shoot pictures of like the Ansu Aros here. It just makes a lot of sense to have great lightning coming in right here where I'm working. One of the things that I really enjoy about my studio and one of the things that I've learned through time and experience that I really need in my professional life is an area where I feel inspired. And one of the ways that I feel inspired is to surround myself with nice things. So I have a beautiful cozy reading chair over here. This is where I think about strategy around the company. This is where I consider new designs or just plainly sit and read some of my books. So this is my thinking slash reading corner. It's a little cluttered, like my mind, and I can have everything within an arm's reach. I would actually go as far as say, this is really part of the essence of who I am. This is depicted here. 
and then add a few posters some pictures my instagram counter just to remind me that i need to be active on social media this is a mechanical counter that is quite noisy so every time it updates it goes click 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 and i use it as a reminder that oh yeah we need to make content so This is actually one of the areas that changed a bit since the last tour because I upgraded my hi-fi. I am a soccer for vintage hi-fi and I tracked down this complete set Marantz with the amplifier and the turntable and studio speakers, all Marantz, which is just, mm, I love the, the sound coming out of this. And music is just such an important factor in my creative life that I need it. I tell you that the flow of this channel would be so much better <laughs> if we could have some old school hip hop just jamming in the background. That's actually one of the biggest downfalls of shooting here and doing creative work in silence. Doing all these videos for you, it's without music on, it's, it's really, really hard. <laughs> And I know that we add them in post, but right here, when we're talking, when we're doing this, it's really difficult. One of the hardest things for me has actually been to do design work in silence and then talking at the same time. But I think I'm getting the hang of it, but it's been a learning curve for sure. Of course, I have my desk with my Mac. Princes, you need princes, even though I don't like looking at them, but they're there. I do a lot of drawing work here. My conference table, if you will. I do a lot of work here as well. Even though I have the, the iMac, I often find myself working on my laptop and that's sitting right here. I do a lot of sketching work here as well. And then we have this old girl here. It's a vintage uh, cabinet for architectural drawings and it's packed with knives. And I know that's one of the things why you come to the channel. So of course we need to just take a little glimpse in here. If you take a look at some of the previous episodes, we have a deep dive in some of this, but um, let's take a look. Of course, a complete collection of giant mouse knives me being one of three founding members and one of two designers in giant mouse of course i have all these these are some of the most sought out knives out there in the production world and i love carrying each and every one of these and then a mix of knives also giant mouse the plethora of knives, if you will. And yes, I know I need to tidy up a little bit here, but you know, okay, yeah, we have plenty of space and then you just add and add and add and suddenly it's just chaotic. I take out a handful of knives for a photo shoot. I'm short of time and then I just throw them in there. More giant mouse knives, more a drawer of some of my Enzo production knives out there. This is just a fraction of what I've been designing over the years, but these are some of the, the newer or some of the ones that have a higher meaning to me. One that is particularly interesting to me is the Spyderco Rock Lobster, because this was the first design that I made for a production company. This is a Spyderco knife and this incidentally is a pre-production prototype of that same design. And I do understand that what we've seen so far from this collection of knives is only scratching the surface. So if you're interested in seeing another episode where we do a a deeper dive into the collection of knives, just let me know in the comments below. 
among the nice things that I surround myself with is this custom-made recurved bow that Simone Tonoli. He's an Italian young guy who's a great knife designer, knife maker, and bow maker. I don't shoot as much as I'd like, but at least I have the equipment for it. And of course, a tour of my studio is not complete without me just mentioning just a little bit about what's on my walls. Through my interest in watches, I've become friends with Ng Tae, who is a known artist and watch collector. And while visiting his studio, he gifted me a couple of his artwork and, and these just have a tremendous value to me. This poster here have a significant meaning to me. It was one I found from a, a small company. I believe it, it was on Kickstarter, but it's good fucking design advice. And if you don't know that company, please go and check it out. It's amazing. And the most important one is trust your fucking gut. Throughout my career as a knife maker and running a company, I've always listened to my gut feeling. If it feels right, it's probably right. If it feels wrong, it's definitely wrong. And only a couple of times I have ignored my gut feeling and every single time it's gone out to the worst. <laughs> so trust your fucking gut. This one is semi-important to me. Let's just call it really important. I went into the final for the Danish Design Award, didn't win. I entered the final, that was huge for me. I've never designed objects where I felt that I had any chance of becoming a known designer, but that at least had a glimpse of that with my Njord uh, kitchen knife set. These are just a few pictures I bought from a street photographer in New York, in Manhattan, because Manhattan just have such a big emotional importance to me, obviously I needed some of that up here. And then finally, a original drawing from a Danish artist who illustrated one of the newer Murakami novels. I love Murakami and I'm reminded of that when I look at this picture. This is probably the area that has seen the most change. This was my old CNC shop. I had crammed a CNC in here and a CNC in here, work tables and all that. And we've moved all the machines uh, about three years ago. Since that, this room was just neglected and became storage and storage on top of storage and probably a little more storage in the corners. <laughs> so this being a room that I walk through maybe 30 times a day, it was really starting to bother me. So now we've made this into a really, really nice showroom and leather workshop. We don't use it all that much, but we do have customers who come and visit us. And it's great to have some knives in the display cases. It's nice to have a cozy area, of course, with the turntable because nothing functioned here without music. And this beautiful vintage drawing table that I bought a few years ago that I haven't really used all that much. One of the goals for this room is that it will be an extension of my studio where I will do creative work. I just haven't really gotten to that point yet. And we are in the grind room, which for a custom knife maker is the most important place in the shop. This is where you turn pieces of metal into knife shaped objects. For a knife maker, there's two things that is never enough, space and grinders. You never have enough space, you never have enough grinders. Actually, my grind room has changed a little bit since you were in here last. Because of space restrictions, I couldn't really make my setup any different than it is right now. 
but behind me used to be my old pre-World War II um, surface grinder. And finally, I was able to move it out of the grind room. I still need it. I still use it. Not a whole lot, but it was just taking up so much real estate in here. I bought this polishing machine recently, came out of a goldsmith shop. It's a little overkill considering that it has a whole dust system in its base and I already got that. So I might be rebuilding it, but I got it for something like $300 and it's a $3,000 machine, I think. So I couldn't help myself but buying that. And it's been sitting in storage for the past year, which I hate and I need it in the shop. But now I actually need to think about the infrastructure now that I have more space and each individual machine is not at a size where its size alone dictates where it sits in the shop. So, but just to run through my grinders really quick, I run a couple of hardcore grinders. They are in my strongest belief, the best available grinders out there. This one is dedicated strictly for sharpening. This is where every single knife that comes out of, of my shop has been sharpened on this. This one is my bevel grinding machine. This is set up with the dedicated platen for grinding. It's a rotary. It's a rotary platen air cooled all the bells and whistles. This setup alone cost more than the machine itself but it's worth its weight in gold and it saved my career basically i was grinding blades every single day and it's rough on your hands and i actually reached a point where my joints were just hurting every single time i ground a blade this setup here has changed that now i grind with a fixture which does several things it saves my hands a bit but it also makes my work much more precise and uh, the last thing is what i find the most uh, joy in every time i can get some equipment that improves the quality of my work i get it if i if it if at all possible i will buy that piece of machinery that hand tool whatever i can do to help improve my work, I will take those steps. And I like buying tools. Are they actually called hardcore grinders? Yes, sir. It's a badass company. And, and, and when you look at the machinings of the, the bodies here and the, the fixtures and the re work rest and all that, you know that you're dealing with somebody who loves good quality product because that they, they are so over engineered every single little knob and edge has been chamfered every detail has just been taken care of and i love that kind of devotion into making a nice product they could have put this out only using 80 percent of what they have spent in time and money in making it a beautiful and nice machine and it would still perform the same it wouldn't feel the same though and i think you can draw a direct parallel to what i'm doing you could stop the process much sooner than i do my knives will would perform the same but they would not feel the same One of the things about having this workshop and having worked in this workshop for so long, and just for reference, I built this workshop in 2001. At a very early stage in making knives, I found that having multiple grinders helped me. And I found over the years why that was. I have a tendency to have dedicated machines that are specifically used for very specific tasks. This one, for instance, this is one of these two machines that I built myself probably around 
2007, five, six, seven. At that point, my brain could comprehend how a three wheel machine would work as opposed to a two wheel machine. This is a little more versatile and it, 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 it function a little easier with whatever um, fixture, whatever wheel you have here, the adjustments of the, the length is a little easier. It's a long story to go into that, but with specialization, that really doesn't matter if you're using two or three wheels. The hardcore grinders here, the idler wheel is, is at the back and the drive wheel is at front where on these, the drive wheel is at back, the idler up here, and then the work surface is here. So that's, that's the main difference between a three wheel grinder and, and a two wheel grinder. It doesn't really matter much when you have a shop like mine where you have one setup and you rarely change it. If, if you change setups all the time and you're dependent on one machine, then picking one of the three wheel grinders might be more ideal for you. You can do exactly the same on a hardcore grinder. It takes a little longer to change the setups, but that's basically it. Every single liner lock and frame lock that comes out of this shop has had the lock face on the blade adjusted on this grinder. I, I built this fixture. It took way longer to figure out than I'd like to admit, two days. But that was only after thinking about it for weeks. So actually making this relatively simple setup took me at least two days. It was probably three. <laughs> Maybe it was four. <laughs> This is the closest you come to having a multifunction grinder here in my shop right now. I can change the wheel and, and do different things on it, but 99% of the time it's set up with this four inch wheel. And I use this specifically to grind the ends of a screw that holds the knife together, like seen on this isolate folder. This old girl here is one of the first machines that I built myself and it's a small it's a small wheel grinder and in my opinion this is probably the third machine that you need to buy as a knife maker. This is so important and the main use for it is you can grind into small radiuses like here at the finger choil. That that's one of the, the hardest parts to finish on a knife if you don't have a small, small wheel grinder. This is coincidentally a hardcore grinder as well. And it has the coolest name. It's the Hardcore Maximizer. And it's, it's just a beautiful machine. And it's, it's one of those machines why I thought if I'm not the right person to have this machine, who would be? <laughs> that might sound a little self-centered, but it, it was that whole phrase came from my, my time in, in college where I had a professor who was teaching uh, illustration with uh, pens and markers, and he had an, an electric pencil sharpener. And we made fun about that, but, but he said, well, they made an electric pencil sharpener. And if I shouldn't have one, who should? This is just a beautiful machine. In my opinion, it's, it's really dedicated. It's really built for production where you make a setup and then you repeat whatever procedure you're doing multiple times. So you, you set an angle in one of these work rests or you set a specific diameter of the wheel. It can swivel back and forth. So if you're working on one piece and you need several different work areas on the machine, it's just beautiful. It takes a little longer to change setup than this old girl. And that is one of the main reasons why I run both of these. 
if, if it's fast to change the wheel, I will change the wheel. If it's slow, I sometimes make do with whatever wheel is on the machine. But this one, I just change to whatever diam diameter that I need. And it's literally this fast. Damn. So it's a matter of seconds to change from one wheel to another and that's that's just key for me. So out here is just for a, a short note. As I said before, space is at a premium. Before I had my brand new service grinder, we've moved that since and now I actually have space. This is something like 15 square meters or 150 square feet and it's more or less available. I put the old surface grinder out here and in order to get it through the door I have to remove the bed. While I have disassembled the machine I might as well clean it up but this is as far as I've gotten into that process so far but it will get there. I have a few tumblers but just having space. <laughs> space is opportunity. I love that. And now we move into the assembly room, which in itself is probably also one of its one of the most important rooms in the shop next to the studio and the grind room. Yeah, everything is important, right? But the assembly room is somewhat similar in my mind to my studio as I spend a lot of time in there. I work with my hands, so I need it cozy, I need it nice, and we actually managed to make it nice last year. This is my main work area when I assemble knives. This is where I sit and lay out whatever project that I'm doing. This is where I do the fine tuning of the locks. I set all the measurements for whatever I'm doing. This is it. And last year I spent some time in here making it really nice. So we made the furniture for the tool wall for all my drawers with parts, all my hammers, just making it a little more nice. Frankly, I haven't had much time to do more. We are not all the way there yet, but it's in working condition. And that is one of the pitfalls on when, when you work with, with stuff around a tight work schedule, you reach a certain point and then we said, let's fix that tomorrow. <laughs> And, and I've actually tried to not have temporary solutions in here. And so far I've succeeded quite well. So I haven't made the temporary solutions that will last 10 years. I just haven't finished it yet. That's different, right? Very different. Like when you put on a brand new watch, that first scratch hurt a lot. And then it becomes yours. Since we shot here last only a couple of days ago, I had a major Dicam explosion. <laughs> Dicam is a layout fluid that I use to, to paint the steel that I'm grinding, paint a piece of metal for, for scriping, whatever you're doing on it. And I had an old aerosol can of Dicam that suddenly started leaking. And I was like, what is that smell? And I found it. So we got a little cleanup in aisle four here, <laughs> but um, I'll get to that tomorrow. If you enjoyed this episode so far, please support the channel by going to my website and where you can find cool products like the Aras. It's available for orders right now. Now we headed to the factory shop tour. I don't know what to call it. It's my shop, it's my extended shop. This is where 
all the CNC machines and some of the other equipment is. This is where my team works with the shop build projects. Let's take a look. So we just entered the first room, which is Karina's office. This is the packaging room. This is where she handles everything. This is the company's most important room. And here comes <laughs> Christian. <laughs> So this is the assembly room in the, the new shop. This is where we are working on all the handwork in correspondence to projects like the Aros. Here, Alan is doing some finishing work on, on some blades. We made an assembly station for the Aros. This is where all the Aros, all the Enso sheep's food projects like that, this is where we do all the assembly. Jens, here you go. Fresh brewed coffee. Thank you. Everyone should have an Anas. So this is a big touchscreen. This is where we run Trello on. We use Trello to plan out everything in production and just every single project that we do is planned through Trello. It's just a fantastic software. Let's move on. Over here is the laser department, and I, I have to say department now because we have two lasers. <laughs> <laughs> so this was the or original Epilogue laser. It's a combined fiber and CO2 laser, so you can engrave metals and cut paper, cardboard, wood, leather. We do all our packaging material on the laser, but the the latest machine in the shop is this little laser here and um, we bought this to do all the engraving on the Aros project. We started out using the old laser to do that but this is a much faster technology and suddenly the laser became a bottleneck for, for engraving parts and cutting and engraving on our packaging material. So this is just a standard cardboard box and we engrave logo and a little text on those. So every time that I find a bottleneck in production, I try to do something about it and then move on. Uh, in one of the previous episodes, I mentioned how the Aras project suddenly made huge changes in production where for the first time ever, the machine time has become the bottleneck. And it's, it's really interesting, but it also creates some challenges. So I do a lot of planning around the machines to make sure that we run them most efficient. We actually uh, working on another part of the Aris project that we never really settled. We want to make a um, a bending jig to um, to take the clips for the arrows from the from the machined version into the the bent version here, and we're working on creating a fixture. And we've been bending these by hand up until now, but once you start adding numbers to a process, then you want to have some kind of controlled process or more controlled process, but also a process that gives a more uniform uh, end result. So we are working in, on a fixture for a press that will make these two bends in, in one go. This old lady is the Haas TM1P, which was my first CNC machine. I bought it in 2010. And when I bought the machine, I had absolutely no knowledge about running a CNC machine. What I did have was I had an extensive knowledge of running CAD software, and that helped the process a lot. But as with many other situations, I thought to myself, how hard can it be? It took a little while. In the past 13, 14 years, this has made so many parts for us. Right now, 
we've actually set it up to only run dry and we have a dust system connected to it so it's running all the fiber materials for the Aras project so we are producing all the the handles for the Aras handles for the Enzo sheep's hood and also we're doing uh, some blade engraving on my custom knives on this machine right now it's it's milling out a a plate of carbon fiber i think it is carbon fiber or rich light it's running right now and it it has so many hours behind the spindle and it just keep keeps on running and it's been such a great machine so far it was my first machine it wouldn't have been my first pick today if i had to go out and invest in one machine but the price that it came with back then suited my budget at the time which was i invested about 10 times as much as my most expensive car at that time which wasn't saying a lot either so this is the haas super mini mill 2 which is my favorite machine after running the the tm1p for a number of years it was just time to have a second spindle having two machines allowed me so much freedom to prepare parts in one continue machining in the other and the biggest bonus with this machine was the upgrade in the the tool carousel on the tm1 i had 10 tools on this one i have 24 plus one which is a huge increase in 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 tool numbers and and suddenly i could start doing more complex machining with this right now well everything in the shop is running rs right now so the tm1 is running rs handles here we are doing all tem scales except there's nothing in here right now and clips so what we do is since the hours for the machines are what's keeping us back right now we are setting up the machines to run after hours so this machine will run a number of hours this is not ideal for producing after hours but we can trick it into believing that it will work a little <laughs> more than it's set up but this is just a beautiful machine and 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 my number one pick if i had to go out and choose a single machine and if i had to start all over this, this is really such a nice machine and it, and it fits my need so well this however this is just a workhorse this is the haas vf2 ss which has a lot of the qualities from the mini mill but in a larger envelope and this one has 30 tools so every time you add tools to the carousel you're adding options you can start machining in a different ways where the number of tools is not holding you back this machine is really set up for running after hours here we are running the chassis part for the hours we can run two plates we're doing some milling on the blade profiles and we're doing the uh, the bevel mill so all in all when we start the machine at uh, the end of the shift it will run anywhere from 6 to 10 to 15 hours of machining on man and that has really helped uh, add to our capacity in the shop this is just such a cool place to be and in reality this is the most important room in the shop of course it is this is the heart of the shop this is where we make all the parts on the cnc machines i love this space and even though we've mainly designed this around working here as a team i still love going in here for instance in my vacation between christmas and new year's i was running a few machines by myself just to make ends meet and get the most out of the year but just going in here on a saturday or sunday and just look at what we've been able to create as a team here it's just a great experience and, and, and it just makes me feel really really good 
what you are able to establish and, and create if you have a goal, if you have um, a vision for the future. But if you've asked me five years ago, how would you like to see your shop uh, roll out? I would never have guessed that this would have been it. The shop is really like a live organism where you have to adapt, you have to change. You, you buy a new piece of equipment, maybe that means that you need to move five other machines in order to make everything run smooth. But I just love this place and um, I think I think you can tell from my grin here, right? <laughs> it, it, it's, it's been a life passion and now I have the team that allows me to grow even further and, and I'm, I'm really thankful for that. It's, it's really cool. And let's check some of the other machines out. This is another one of my favorite machines. Really the most important machine in the shop. <laughs> no, not really, but every knife maker needs a bandsaw. And this is a vintage, vintage makes it sound cooler, right? This is a 1962, I believe. Let me check. Yeah, it's 1962 Mössner Record. I don't know how to pronounce that, it's German, but it's Spitzenklatzen. This is one of the, the machines that is so well built that here now, even after almost 60 years, okay, my math is really wrong, but 62 years after it was made, it's still running just full speed. It's such a nicely made machine and you can't really get equipment like this anymore except if you buy it used. Love it. What's a knife shop without a couple of drill presses? With the glorified drill presses behind me, <laughs> I guess you don't really need them, need them, but they always come in handy. And if for nothing else, to do repair work around other stuff or add a hole in a fixture, whatever, these vintage Danish brand called Clue is also another example of you can't really buy equipment like this new anymore. These are roughly 56 years old and they just keep on running and, and they run smooth and quiet and it's really hard to beat the quality that you made back in the 60s. Every machine shop needs a lathe. We don't have a huge use for it and we don't currently produce any products of this machine, but it's, it's come in really handy for all kinds of repair jobs and just making a small bushing and stuff like that. I've had this machine for close to 25 years by now. And even though it, it's not used every day or very often, you can't really run a machine shop like this without having one. This came out of a, a school workshop and a friend called me up and said, hey, I just got offered two, um, two lays for free if you just pick them up. And I got one of them. So it's been sitting here since. And even though it was a school machine, it was in good condition. And only thing we had to do was raise it up a little to get it up in proper man height, right? <laughs> I believe that every knife shop should have the ability to heat treat by themselves. Having a heat treat oven can allow you to make that one project or how, however many projects that, that you need. I've been doing my own heat treat for the past, I'd like to say 15 years. I actually started using a heat treat company again for when we ship out some of the larger amount of blades just for the, um, the speed of things, but also for the consistency in a full batch. Once you start sending out 150 blades at the same time, it just makes a lot of sense. So having it is great. Having the ability to ship out is, is crucial right now. 
this is actually one of the rooms over here that's seen the most change recently. This is the grind room and bead blasting room. We have a bench for doing a little assembly work or other finishing work. The Enso Grindmaster 2000 is important. This was my second machine that I built. The first one doesn't exist anymore. This one is new. We talked about this in the previous episode, but we actually moved our new surface grinder in here. And every time you think, now I have more than enough space, you fill it out, then you have to expand. And we were able to expand in here by adding 350 square feet or 35 square meters. This is a room in progress. We added a sink, another one of the hardcore maximizers, and eventually this room will be all done and most of the grinding jobs will take place in here. The, the small idea that becomes reality I often have notes in my notebook where I say, oh, it would be cool to have this amount of space. Let's move the surface grinder at some point, and then we could add another machine. Then we could use the space that we got from moving that machine to something else. <laughs> I put that down in notes, and suddenly, looking back at it, it's happening. <laughs> This concludes the shop tour. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm sure that this is not the last shop tour that you'll see. As I said before, this is a living organism. I buy new equipment. I change layout. We do all kinds of cool stuff around here. So I'm sure that within a year we need another one. But until then, I really hope you enjoyed this. Hit like and subscribe, leave a comment. I will answer. And until next time, see you later. By the way, the Enzo Aros, if you want to support this channel, this is available for order right now. There's a link below.